Monty, you have been so instrumental in uh, kind of pointing me in the right direction. And <laughs> it was about um, looking at your character defects and spirituality. Uh, it, it's the integration of clinical practices with uh, the 12 steps. It's an absolute pleasure. He certainly knows a lot of people. Uh, he's got a lot of energy. And sometimes when you don't have so much energy, he picks you up and carries you. And the monster man there certainly helps. This is one of the places that is about the business of the solution. The views expressed on this special broadcast of the Take 12 Radio Show do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. KHLT is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. Now here's that guy who's getting less popular minute by minute, your host, The Multiman. Hello, everybody. What the heck are you doing? How are you doing? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another fine episode of Take 12 Radio, a recovery radio, recovery talk and positive music uh, on Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. We are broadcasting from the studios of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting on the outskirts of beautiful downtown Albany, Oregon, worldwide, globally. The only faith-based, solution-focused recovery radio station in existence broadcasting to you a unique recovery show every single day of the week. And in addition, some really good positive music that is uh, focused on recovery, focused on spirituality, and uh, that's available for you too. Our email address is take12radio at comcast.net. And uh, I encourage you, uh, it, just in the last uh, month or so, we have given our website a facelift. Everybody's going green, so I thought, why not? Why, well, we should do it too. So it's, uh, I don't know how environmentally um, wonderful it is, but there's a green theme running through the website. I hope you enjoy it. It's a lot more user-friendly. Uh, it, it's it, just things, being able to maneuver the site is a lot easier for you. And uh, by the time this show is broadcast, hopefully we'll be up on iTunes, and so you can uh, subscribe to the feed there. And then you don't even have to go to the website anymore. You just just click on subscribe, and then there'll be a notification on your phone or tablet uh, or on your computer that tells you when a show updates. You can subscribe to our shows, by the way, by clicking on uh, subscribe uh, at Take12Radio.com, and it'll give you a show update uh, just about every single day. Well, hey, listen, uh, you know, it, what, it's a brand new year, 2014, can you believe it? I mean, my goodness sakes, I, I, I just, you know, we have this tradition in our home where we go out onto the ports and we bang pots and pans and scream like maniacs, um, and uh, the, na- the neighbors don't mind because they're all doing the same thing. I, I, I hope this is a safe time of year for you. Uh, I would encourage you uh, to... To, to really hone up on your meeting schedule skills. If you cannot get to a meeting, uh, and, and you know, the holidays don't just run from November to December. They kind of, you know, they kind of float on over into January and February for some of us, uh, cause it's kind of an emotional time of year. Um, <clears throat> if you can't get to one, uh, let me encourage you to go to intherooms.com. They're one of our sponsors. And uh, check out their their meeting schedule. Uh, we had um, over the holidays we we posted the uh, the marathon meeting schedules at the very top of our web page. Uh, but you can go down to the bottom of any of our pages and click on the in the rooms link, and uh, and and get involved there. Would you please? I really would encourage you to do that because some of you literally cannot get out of your home um, for one reason or another, and it's just a, a great resource for you. All right. <clears throat> Having said all that, uh, I'd like to welcome our, our, our guest this week. Mark Dunn is, uh, uh, what some of you, you, you may have heard this term in the last few years. It's getting more and more, uh, well known, uh, the term recovery coach, uh, or, uh, uh, basic life skill mentor, uh, life coach, uh, that kind of thing. Well, Mark is one of these guys. Um, now we're not going to be talking so much about that as much as we are going to be talking about, um, 
you know, getting the information out there, get, getting the, the public to understand and know that recovery works, that the 12-step model works, that there is a high, high level of success with that, even though it may not be as high as it was at one time, comparatively speaking to other, uh, uh, avenues uh, of recovery, treatment, and that kind of thing. The 12-step model seems to be the most successful. And and yet, uh, we've been keeping it a, a, a secret. And we're going to discuss uh, why that is and what we can do about, uh, you know, remedying that, that, that problem. Mark Dunn was one of the first meeting leaders on the uh, social networking site In The Rooms. And they, by the way, are the largest worldwide recovery community. And uh, as a member of the recovery community, Mark has involved or evolved rather from an alcoholic who thought he knew all the answers to a recovery coach with an open minded approach to helping patients according to their needs, not the dogma of the hour. I really like that. Mark, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you, Monty. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, you what one of the things you were talking about brought me back to that very first online meeting I did. Uh, if you wanted to talk about that, we could. Absolutely. It was quite uh, revelatory to me. You okay? So let's just, let's discuss that here in just a minute, though. But before we do that, I want you to qualify with the listeners a, a, a little bit. Uh, you know, you sound like a pretty healthy guy. I've seen your picture, and you know, you're, you're a handsome gentleman. I mean, things seem to be going a lot better for you than in the past, correct? Yeah. Uh, thank God. I'm, uh, I, I, I celebrated eight years on November 29th of 2013. Wow. Uh, I spent 45 years drinking and drugging. Uh, let's say the first 10 years of my life I didn't. But uh, I'm uh, going to be 67 at the end of January. And uh, I... My life is beyond beyond my wildest dreams. Sixty-seven. You don't look sixty-seven, man. Come on. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's not. It, you know what I like to tell people is it's I, I'm well preserved because of all the alcohol I drank. <laughs> so let me let me ask you before we get on the, this topic of, of in the rooms and social media and the meetings and that. Um, <clears throat> Is there more for, especially for the new listeners and advocates and family members who may be listening? Is there more to this recovery thing than just removing the alcohol? Gosh, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I was taught early on in recovery was that we're dealing with two things: we're dealing with a physical addiction and a mental health issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was. That was something that I had trouble on both fronts uh, coming to grips with, um, and 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 I never did a, a detox. I never did a rehab. I never did anything other than just stop and start to go to meetings. And I did it twice. Mm-hmm. And the first time I did it, I didn't embrace any of the principles, any of the um, recovery tools that were given to me. I just stubbornly, and I, and I believe that we are as, as stubborn as they come uh, as a group, <laughs> those of us with addictions. Yes. Um, and I just stubbornly didn't drink for two and a half years. Wow. I had given up my drugs by then. Um, I had uh, stopped, you know, cocaine and, and uh, marijuana and pills and all the other shit that I was doing. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I allowed to use four-letter words here, Monty? Uh, this is Internet radio. The FCC isn't quite as picky. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll try and I'll try and limit myself. I have a foul mouth. Uh, but anyway, I had uh, uh, I had quit all the other stuff. It was drinking, and um, and and I just you know I stubbornly did not drink for two and a half years. Yeah. And never thought about going back to it, but was going to I I, I was going to get everybody off my back. Yeah. Everybody had gotten on me. Things had gotten uh, sloppily worse, and um, I just stopped drinking. And, yeah. and I didn't drink for two and a half years. And then out of the blue, and, and I can't say that I consciously thought about it, but out of the blue, one night at dinner, I announced that, you know what, it's been two and a half years. I think I can drink again. 
Yeah, why not? You deserve it, right? Right, yeah. exactly. And it didn't take long. Within six months, I was a mess. Wow. It worse than ever before. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, thank 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 God you didn't die. I mean, we know, we know that story. Most of us know that story about the guy that was was sober for <clears throat> thirty some odd years. And what was he? He, he started drinking again. What was it just a couple of years? He was dead. Yeah. Yeah. That right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Out of the big book. Yeah. Yeah. And, wow. And I tried. Trust me, I tried to kill myself. I mean, not you know consciously. Sure. But the stuff I was doing. And, I mean, just as a brief aside, my last drunk was a blackout on the interstate in the middle of the afternoon. Wow. And totaled my car, um, left my family without any idea of where I was, what yeah. had become of me, you know, yeah. that particular afternoon, because with with all of my, you know, um, drinking, I was still that guy that came home from work every day and was there for his kids, for his wife, you know, I, I just, I was regular about it. And yeah. one afternoon, they couldn't find me. And I was in the emergency room, <sighs> not because I was hurt, but because I had over my car and the paramedics and the police and everybody were there and they carted me off and I was fine other than I was drunk. Man. A blackout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and not to not to minimize it or to justify drinking and driving at all, but but you know, you probably heard it from doctors, right? It's probably a good thing your body was in that condition; otherwise, you'd have been dead. Probably. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Well, uh, okay, Mark. So you went through all this stuff. You, you you got cleaned up again, and and you're moving through life. Uh, what was different this time? I mean, were you applying the principles that that are found in those steps? Is that what happened? I wanted, I, I surrendered. Mm. What happened to me was I, I came to a conclusion after that last uh, episode that if I drank again, I was going to die. Sure. Uh, and maybe not the next day or the first drink. Mm. But I was I was definitely going to die soon, and um, I didn't want to. So I, um, I I started listening. I, I remember it was so funny. I remember the first I don't know month or so. I would come in and I would raise my hand at a meeting, and I would proceed to tell this horrific story that I thought was so unique about crashing on the interstate and the middle of the afternoon and a blackout and I walked away from it and here I am to testify. And I remember guys, you know, with several years coming up to me after the meetings and patting me on the shoulder and saying, it's okay, Mark, you just keep coming back. <laughs> How patronizing. <laughs> and I, I didn't get it. They were, so they were being kind. They were, they were, they were being kind and tolerant. Yeah. And, Finally, after about, I don't know, 30 days or so, I, I, I kind of got it. Like, I was there to listen. <laughs> it was good that I was sharing, but I was there to listen until I understood that I needed to talk about what I was doing, not, you know, yeah. what I was thinking or what I did. Sure. Well, they were... And I started, and I started doing it, you know. I yeah. got a sponsor. I, I, I jumped right into the steps. I... I started, uh, you know, becoming friendly with uh, guys in recovery. Right. Uh, I listened. The, the most the fucking amazing thing to me was that guys 20 and 30 years younger than me, uh -huh. five and ten years sobriety, I was listening to them and taking to heart the stuff they were saying to me. Right. And, and I would get done, you know, talking to one of these guys, and I'd be driving home, and I'm thinking, who the fuck am I all of a sudden? Hmm. Taking advice from kids, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> that, that's funny, and, and I, I got to say, uh, those guys were being were being pretty kind to you, saying keep just keep coming back, Mark. I mean, some of us got blasted with that. You have nothing to say. Shut up, sit down. Take the cotton out of your ears. Put it in your mouth. You know that kind of stuff. And um, I don't see that in the big book anywhere, but I know people have done that. Uh, <laughs> but you, it sounded like they're a little more tolerant with you. Uh, but you did it, you, you, and, you, and you stuck around, and, and you listened, and you applied the principles, and, and you did this thing. And 
then you got involved uh, yep. in other people's lives. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want you to tell us about that, how you got involved within the rooms and why it's important to Mark Dunn that he publicly share the success that this thing can bring and the victory we can have over this terrible malady. So, folks, don't go away. More with my guest, Mark Dunn, when we return. Origins Recovery Centers provides integrated inpatient treatment for substance abuse and co-occurring disorders. At Origins, clients receive expert medical, clinical, and spiritual care individually designed for their needs. Our clients leave Origins with the foundation upon which they will build the rest of their lives. Call now to speak with an admissions specialist. Our toll-free number is 888-843-8935. That's 888-843-8935. Origins, delivering real solutions for real families. Treatment does not have to be voluntary to be effective. Sanctions and enticements from family, employment settings, and or the criminal justice system can significantly increase treatment entry, retention rates, and the ultimate success of drug treatment interventions. Freedom Interventions provides the direction necessary to get the help of an addiction intervention. We assist with selecting a treatment experience appropriate for the unique needs of your addicted loved one and provide six months of ongoing support to ensure success for everyone involved in the transition into real life. If you know someone who needs a life-saving intervention, visit freedominterventions.com or call 888-762-7557. That's 888-762-7557. Freedom Interventions, providing drug and alcohol interventions and a continuum of care services to clients and their families. Take12radio.com is the world's only recovery talk and positive music station, broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All right, then, welcome back. And my guest this week is Mark Dunn. And by the way, uh, uh, listeners, if you've got a pen handy, uh, here is Mark's website. It's M A R C J. Done, D-U-N-N dot com. We're going to be talking about that here in just a few seconds. Um, okay, Mark, so <clears throat> just going to meetings, being meeting dependent, not God dependent, putting the plug in the jug, all those cutesy little things we talk about wasn't enough. You got involved. What happened? Uh, two, well, there were two, two different aspects to it. Uh, the one was, you know, I heard the, the message that I, I had to be of service, mm-hmm. and the only way that I could really stay in recovery was that I had to give it back. I had to carry the message. I had to do something beyond just, you know, uh, taking it out and, and being, you know, in recovery and being serene in the meetings. I had to take it into my life. I had to go out, you know, outside the rooms with it. And so the first thing was um, I volunteered to go to the county jail and start doing a meeting in the county jail uh, here locally. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would go in there and be uh, 100 guys incarcerated in a substance abuse program. And I start talking to those guys and, uh, you know, bringing people in to talk to them and, and doing that service thing. And um, one of the things, and, and I will tell you this in, in terms of, this was for me because of my background. I was, uh, I'm, I'm Jewish, and um, I noticed that a lot of rooms, a lot of meetings, for the most part, 90% or more, was in a clubhouse or in a church. Mm-hmm. And I went and uh, spoke to the rabbi of my synagogue, and I said, can we do a meeting here? Wonderful. And he said, sure, Absolutely. And, and I shared with him about my recovery. And um, I put it out there, you know, that there was going to be a meeting at the synagogue and that we were going to talk about recovery, you know, uh, and we were going to talk about it in terms of our faith and the spiritual aspects of our faith. And um, the local, uh, what the, I don't know what you have out in Oregon or other parts of the country, but there's something called the Jewish Journal down here, which is, you know, a weekly newspaper. Uh-huh. And it's put out by the by the main publication in the area, and they got wind of this, and they called me and asked me if I would talk to them about it. And I talked to my sponsor, 
uh, I, I let myself, you know, um, absorb what exactly that would mean. And the bottom line for me was, you know what? We're supposed to carry the message to other alcoholics and help them achieve sobriety. And that didn't mean that I had to speak for AA. It didn't mean that I had to put myself out there as a spokesperson. Yeah. But to me, what it meant was I didn't have to be secretive. Right. I, I could be, <clears throat> be as open as I wanted to be with whoever I wanted to be as much as I wanted to be, as long as I was just letting whoever I was talking to know that this is what I've done and this is how I'm living my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I let myself uh, be interviewed by this guy, and, and I you know, told him I don't speak for any fellowship. Right. <laughs> All I'm talking about is recovery. And um, it was phenomenal, Monty, because... I had people within the community, especially the Jewish community, come up and hug me and shake my hand. Wonderful. Because, because they had family that was struggling, and they were appreciative to see somebody coming out and talking about it and not pretending it's <clears throat> this. Yeah, yeah, and, and let me interject here, if I if I may. Uh, you're a member of the faith community. I'm a member of the faith community. Not everybody is. Um, and, and, and one of the things that has been a struggle for a long time is, um, uh, well, the Greek word is ekklesia, which means a, a body of people called out for a specific purpose. Um, the, the German, uh, terminology that is church, and that's where we get the word church and, and that kind of thing. But, but the body of, of believers in God, you know, throughout our, uh, um, 70 some odd years that the mothership Alcoholics Anonymous has been around um they've struggled with this right I mean did you did you find that they're just you know wasn't I mean when you first started looking into this that within those who who believed in you know a heavenly father that they really didn't know how to deal with the alcoholic bless their heart yeah, and um, I don't know if you're familiar with Slaying the Dragon, okay. uh, uh, the book that was written about the uh, history of um, recovery and, and addiction right. in the United States. And it goes back into, you know, colonial days and, and the early, you know, reference to those that member of the community who drank too much, you know, was a drunkard. Right. And, and, he, and ostracized, ostracized from the church, ostracized from society yeah. and pretty much you know and, and that's where the whole image of the drunk you know mm. brown bags mm -hmm. and a bridge you know that's where all of that you know got started from and and then it's kind of funny to me that the solution was well let's take him to church and you know let's give him religion and that'll cure him yeah how's and, that working for you <laughs> <laughs> and it isn't it isn't that that's bad it's just that no. we don't we don't we don't know how to connect the dots, right? Yeah, and that was a struggle until yeah. you know uh, Bill uh, and and Doctor Bob finally put it together that you know there's a combination of things going on here. You, you know, you've got the the physical addiction, you and you've got the mental you know issues, and you've got the lack of spirituality, the bankruptcy of, of spiritual spiritual. Sure. And and um, all of that had to be in tune in certain dynamics in order for people like us to start understanding what we had to do to be in recovery. And it's so fascinating to me that if you look at Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, uh, you know, Muslim, Hindu, they all have the same spiritual principles. There's no great diversions of spiritual principles in any, any of those. And they all are embodied in the 12 steps and in recovery. And, and this is supposed to be the main purpose for uh, many 12-step, you know, especially the mainstream ones, uh, their literature, you know, it even says in the beginning of the AA Big Book, you know, th this is the purpose of this book. And we dance around this issue uh, like it's the least important in so many of our 12-step support meetings. I, I'm just, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing and you did what you did, man. I, I mean, um, 
I, I think we're kind of coming full circle again. I think we're, we're starting to get it. We've, you know, we kind of got away from, uh, we, we started becoming man centered, right? And not God centered. And, yeah. uh, because yeah. people became meeting dependent, people became step dependent. You know, the steps, there's no power in the steps. The steps are there to show us our need for a power. And, um, you know, I, I even, I got to tell you, Mark, I mean, I, I, and I learned this from one of my co-hosts over the years, even my prayer life, I was becoming dependent on my prayers and not the one I was praying to. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. So whatever, that's, a good, that's a good thought. And, and there is there's so much, see, I take issue, gosh, I don't want to say I take issue, I, I have found for me, that it's my higher power first. Yeah, yeah. All the other stuff. I mean, there are there are there are some that believe it's sobriety first. Uh huh. Maybe it's chicken and an egg thing. But for me, if my higher powers first, then I will have the other things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 in the good book, you know, is seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto it. Uh, right. It, it's got to be first. It's got to. It's got to be God. And I, I love uh, uh, the youth pastor uh, of our church tells the kids. Or, I'm sorry. The 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 football coach at, at at our at the high school my son goes to tells our kids. Look at families first. Your if if you're connected with a spiritual institution, that comes second, and football is third. And and, and I love that. But we've lost some of that in society today, and, and I'm glad to, <coughs> to to hear that 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 is is coming back with so many people. Mark, let me um, l- let's touch on this thing within the rooms. Uh, tell us about how you got involved with that. You you, you were uh, one of the first first leaders uh, uh, meeting uh, facilitators for in the rooms dot com, correct? Yes. I have a relationship with um, R.T. and, and uh, Mr. Clean. Uh, yeah. Going back 30, 40 years. Wow. Uh, R.T. and I know each other from uh, Gainesville, Florida, back in the early 70s. And uh, before either one of us uh, had any inkling that uh, recovery was in our future. And uh, when they started in the rooms, uh, I would was big supporter. I mean, I, I would, you know, make announcements and I would be told, you can't announce that in a meeting. <laughs> oh, really? okay, well, I won't next time. And then I would <laughs> again, you know. <laughs> and, um, uh, that's great. And, and I talked a lot with them about it and, and they, you know, believed, like I did, that we didn't have to be secretive. Um, right. That we didn't have to speak on behalf of a fellowship but we didn't have to be secretive. And I was already, so to speak, out of the closet. You know, I yeah. was um, publicly, you know, in recovery, and I really didn't care who knew, and, and neither did they. And when they um, started to do the, the um, online meetings, the interactive video meetings, they came to me and they said, we want to do one that is for um, AA. Mm-hmm. Since we're both in NA, will you do the AA one? So I said, yeah, I'm in. And it started off one night a week. Uh, it was 10 o'clock Eastern time. And I will never forget this. I, I, it was either the first or second um, meeting. I, I, I don't know if, if uh, should I explain a little bit how it works? Yeah, with the video and the- a- absolutely, absolutely. People click on, you know, the, the meeting uh, time on the site where there's a thing that says video meetings. And they're brought to a page, and there's a facilitator, which could be me or one of 30 or 40 others, because they've got, I think, close to 100 meetings now, different days, different times of the day. And the facilitator controls um, enabling people to share. And so as a facilitator, I would enable myself, I would share, and then I'd open the meeting up. And sometimes, I remember in the beginning, we had 60, 70 people, Sometimes we have 20 or 30 people. Usually it's somewhere between 50 and 70 now. And I do a meeting at 6 o'clock Eastern time, Sunday nights. I'm still doing it. And 
close to, I think it's two years now. But anyway, um, you turn, you hit a button, turn the camera on, then you hit a button, request to share, and it puts you up in a box that I can see you raised your hand. And I see this young guy in the box. So I, you know, uh, he's got a screen name that we see, a username. Right. And I call on him, and he comes in to speak, and he starts telling the story, and he's got a, quite a heavy accent. He's in Sweden. He starts talking about how three months earlier he was living in a tent in a forest, and he had now come into recovery, and he had been given a laptop and a place to live in a, an apartment, and he was going to meetings, and he wanted to thank people in recovery for giving him this opportunity mm. and for being there on the Internet for him to have somewhere to be of service and to share. And it just it, it blew me away. I, wow. I realized the, the power and the, and the scope of this site. I mean, there would be people come in from India. There would be people from the U.K., uh, from New Zealand, from Canada, West Coast, East Coast. And it's like that. I mean, and not, you know, I'm not the meaning that I do, but it's like that all the time, you know, every day. There's like 250 or 300,000 people that are part of in the rooms, and there's 50 or 100 of them doing meetings several mm -hmm. times a day. Mm -hmm. hey, that's that, like that's said in the in the open. You know, if you can't get to a face-to-face, -face, this is a great way to enhance your recovery. And, and it's actually a registered uh, AA meeting, is it not? AA has not recognized it yet. Okay. It's in the process. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on. I'm probably not helping by talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know, Mark. Uh, they're getting a little better. <clears throat> you know, the general service office has gotten a little little strange in some areas. I mean, they're they're getting more fellowship focused and less God focused. And that's been my experience. And that's and I think that's kind of dangerous. Uh, but there are other aspects where they've actually gotten better and and, and i don't know I, I i think i think it'll be recognized uh there are <clears throat> oh it's funny na has recognized the na meetings mm -hmm. and aa is still uh reserving its its final stamp of approval and i, and I think like you do it'll come yeah the jury's still out on it but it, it'll 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 come uh <clears throat> now you don't even have to have you don't have to have a video camera or a microphone so, uh, listeners, if you want to do this, uh, you're not limited to that. I mean, if you can type um, on your keyboard, um, but uh, what a cool deal. But you, Ponte, you can only listen without a webcam. Oh, you can only listen without, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. But maybe maybe that's a gift for some, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure to those that would rather I only I didn't have a webcam that I was just there listening. <laughs> I want to uh, <clears throat> I want to take just a, a second, Mark, to um, see if I can bring it up if it, if it was on here. Well, let's see here. It's it's not. It went bye bye. But I, I was going to read. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase this as best I can. Uh, this actually comes from AA Conference Approved Literature. It comes from a book, uh, folks, called Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. If you have a question about what anonymity really is about, you need to read this book. And Dr. Bob describes it uh, very well. And uh, forgive me, because I'm not going to get everything word for word. I know how important uh, proper recovery language is to so many of you. <clears throat> Loosen up, please. Um <clears throat> but this is basically what, what Dr. Bob said. He, he, he said it should become uh, uh, plain, clear, evident to anybody who can understand the English language. He kind of he gave a dig there. Um, you know what this thing means, that the anonymity tradition is, the, is at the level of <clears throat> press, radio, film, uh, it, you know, nowadays they're, they're including internet and, and television, uh, and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and that uh, to to protect your personal anonymity at any other level is is just as so much a violation is is if you 
uh, didn't do that at the level of press radio and film because one is above the level and one's below the level. And uh, that there is no room for personal anonymity within the fellowships. That's a no-no. Uh, because how in the world are we going to communicate with each other? How are we going to visit each other, whether it's in jail or in a hospital? or uh, How are we going to reach out to each other if all I know is you're Railroad Joe and you're Bottle Bob and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so Dr. Bob explains this. Um, and, and here's the thing. And I know, Mark, you and I are very much on the same page. Anonymity does not mean secrecy. It does not. It, um, we are, and I mentioned this at the top of the, the hour, we, we, there's not enough evidence out there that 12 step, the 12 step model works because half of the, half of the problem falls on us 12 steppers. We've been hiding in the basements of our churches, meeting halls, clubhouses, and have not been poking our head out because we thought that anonymity meant we couldn't share our story. It's the public relations policy of that 12-step fellowship that's based on attraction rather than promotion. The public relations policy, not your personal stories. Eee, gas, I wish people would, would read this stuff instead of, you know, cherry-picking it and pulling words out and, and, and because it drives me crazy. And so people... They don't know that this works. The, the general community doesn't know that it works uh, as much as they could if we would simply understand what this thing really means. And, and you said it, and I've said it too, anonymity does not mean secrecy. Uh, and you can tell I, I, I'm passionate about this. <laughs> you know, and I, I came under fire when I started doing the radio program. But, you know, if people will, that's the thing. People do not read. People do not listen. They have their own agenda. Um, and sometimes, uh, folks go back, rewind this show, go back and listen to the disclaimer at the very beginning. We claim no affiliation with any particular 12 step fellowship. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, and uh, I'm the Monty Man, and now I have to use my last name in some areas on the website because of FCC regulations, but but the law of the land always trumps the traditions. We we believe that in our 12-step fellowships, um, but I, I've never claimed on the air that I'm a representative of or even a member of, um, and, and yet I get emails once in a while, that, and people just, they, they, don't, they don't listen. They, they're not paying attention, are they, Mark? <laughs> no, it's, and I've been called out the same way as like you're talking about. Yeah, but you know something? There's there's a several documentaries that have been produced in the last few years. Uh, one of them called Bill W. Right, which is the story of uh, Bill and 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 actually the, the 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 tribulations and and a lot that he went through, having to feel like he had no personal life that he. You know, was looking for some kind of privacy just because, um, the, you know, the expectations on him. But there are videos of him talking yes. about recovery and about AA. And the traditions. Around yeah. him being interviewed and about the fellowship. And, I mean, if, if he expected everything to be anonymous and no, you know, no film, then why did he allow himself to be videoed speaking? Yeah. So why was why was that all that effort put out even back in the beginning with the meeting with Rockefeller back in the early days and the, right. the Saturday Evening Post article and and all that stuff we've heard about and um, look it's a it's a different world there's there's uh, a documentary called The Silent Majority uh, there's another one called The Secret World of Recovery. and a third one called Anonymous People Anonymous People yeah that's the newest one yeah. Yeah, and 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 they're all you know stories of people in recovery sharing about the recovery, and all of the all of the methods and means there are at people's disposals to get help and and to help others in recovery, and and the fact that there is so many millions and millions of people that are in recovery, and there's so many. Double and triple that amount that yeah. aren't, and because a lot of it is because they're afraid to step forward and say they have, you know, they have a problem. Right. 
And we know that, that, that addiction is the number one health threat in our nation. Number one, above, above any other health uh, concern, it's number one. And yet it gets the least amount of attention, the recovery from it, uh, because of the stigma. And if anybody's going to break the stigma, it's going to be us. We have to. Yeah. I mean, I, that's what I believe. I mean, we have to. If we're going to help other people uh, achieve sobriety, then regular guys like you and I have to, you know, raise our hand and say, hey, you know, I haven't had a drug or a drink since November 29th, 2005. There is a way to live a better life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you bet. Well, we're going to take uh, our last break here. In, in fact, here's our, our newest uh, promo for In the Rooms. Uh, and, uh, and our sponsor for this, um, this half of the show, Serenity Springs Recovery Center. So don't go away, folks. Check this out. <coughs> Pardon me, dude. Are you in the rooms? Bro, I've been going to meetings for years. Yeah, but dude, but are you in the rooms? Bro, I'm in meetings all the time. Of course I'm in the rooms. Yeah, but are you registered on in the rooms? Bro, you're not making any sense. Dude, pay attention. I'm talking about InTheRooms.com. It's only the world's largest online recovery social networking site Mm -hmm. for recovery folks like you and me, dude, or anyone seeking help from any addiction. You, You get exclusive free access to daily meditations, speaker tapes, and daily online video AA and NA meetings, dude. There are close to 300,000 members who are willing to share their yeah. experience, strength, yeah. and hope yeah. with you, dude. With me? Yeah, with you. Here's what you do. What's that? Get on your computer, your smartphone, or your tablet, and type in www.intherooms.com. It's for fun and for free, dude. D- dude, what are you doing? Well... I just did what you said. Now, I'm in the rooms. Dude, bro, we're both in the rooms. Dude, bro, yeah. Dude, yeah. Yeah, dude. Hey, bro, uh, I'm hungry. Are you in the pizza? Dude. Oh, dude. In the rooms, the world's largest recovery social networking site with something for everybody. Visit www.intherooms.com and register for free. This is Chris Schroeder. You are listening to Take12Radio.com, recovery talk and positive music. Hey there, this is the Monty Man from Take 12 Recovery Radio, and I am proud to introduce to you a new fully licensed all-male residential treatment facility located on the beautiful east coast of Florida. Serenity Springs Recovery Center is a 10-acre spiritual sanctuary fostered through an intensive 12-step foundation of recovery. Addiction is a disease that deteriorates the body, punishes the mind, and destroys the spirit. It needs to be attacked on all three of these fronts, and Serenity Springs does just that. A unique facility that is committed to providing exceptional individual care in small group settings while utilizing their experienced and dedicated clinical and support staff of licensed therapists and doctors. 30, 60, and 90-day individualized treatment programs are available. Call 386-423-4540 or visit their website at serenityspringsrecovery.com. That's 386-423-4540. Serenity Springs, making a life-changing investment into your recovery. Well, welcome back, and uh, you've tuned in to Take12Radio.com on your internet dial, broadcasting from KHLT Recovery Broadcasting Studios in uh, beautiful downtown Albany, Oregon. Mark Dunn is uh, our guest. Mark's website is N-A-R-C-J-D-U-N-N.com, MarkJDunn.com. Uh, Mark, uh, let's shift gears just uh, for a minute here. Um, what is this, the rest of your life thing? T- tell the listeners about what you're doing with this. With the coaching? Yeah. There is a organization um, called CCAR, Connected mm-hmm. Community of Addiction Recovery. And they started several years ago a training uh, course, and they call it the Recovery Coach Academy. And they have uh, PhD doctorates 
who uh, facilitate and conduct the courses, and it is uh, five days of intense training in helping somebody transform their life. Uh, a recovery coach is not a sponsor. A recovery coach is about um, helping someone change their lifestyle and their life uh, choices. Uh, one of the best examples I have is if you were uh, an athlete and you were playing baseball mm -hmm. and you were having a problem hitting the outside curve, well, your hitting coach would change your your the way you you approached it. The hitting coach would help you practice that until you could accomplish the goal. Well, with a recovery coach, you're doing other things than uh, using substances. Uh, you're not eating right. You're probably not exercising. Uh, you're probably not connecting on any kind of spiritual level with that part of your life. You are... You, you need a plan of wellness. And what a recovery coach is trained to do is to have you write that wellness plan and then coach you to stick to it. And if it's a 12-step uh, 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 fellowship as part of it, that's fine. But there are other ways um, that people are staying sober and living productive lives that are not 12-step based. And right. maybe your choice. Right. It's my job as a coach not to judge your choice but to coach you in how to do those things. And, and, and here's yeah. what uh, we're, we're going to be having um, <clears throat> uh, Tim Harrington on. Uh, he, he, he also is a recovery coach. And, and what I'm learning, listeners, uh, because I know there's I know there's, yeah, there's a little bit of a controversy amongst the 12 step rooms. You know, why do I need a recovery coach? Do I have a sponsor? Why do I, do I need a sponsor if I've got a recovery coach? And one of the things that I'm realizing, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, sponsors say all the time, you know, or, or at least they claim this, <laughs> uh, I'm not your marriage counselor, I'm not your financial uh, budgeteer, I, I'm not your tax man, I'm, you know, I, I'm not your your meal provider or your or your meal ticket, you know, in some cases I'm not even your ride to a meeting, you know, I'm your sponsor, I'm not even your friend. And I don't know how that works. I mean, I, I don't know how you cannot become friends, but, but, but if that's the case, um, we, many of us need some guidance and help in basic life skills that may not be directly associated with working the steps with a sponsor. True. I, I yes, I, I believe that a hundred percent. There, there is so much more to recovery than just the steps and going to meetings. Right. Um, there's a whole different dimension. One of the tragic things that I hear over and over again is people in recovery, they start doing meetings and they start doing steps, but they don't do anything outside of that. I know. They isolate. Uh, they, they don't change their eating habits. They, they don't uh, do anything with their fitness. Uh, they don't even go to church or synagogue or yeah. participate in any kind of spiritual mm -hmm. growth. And and it's it's so explicit in there, in our recovery manuals, that we're supposed to do that stuff. You know, not necessarily a specific one. No. We are supposed yeah. to enlarge our spiritual life. Yes. One of the greatest pleasures I had, and, and I still do to this day, is I have an anniversary party every year, and I invite everybody that has an anniversary in the same month that I do, and we have, bring your spouse, bring your kids, bring whoever, and we, you know, we eat, and, and we share stories, and I put, you know, music videos on the TV, and we hang out, and and it's just, it's so important. I go out to dinner with people you know that are in recovery. Go to the movies. Uh, you know, do stuff other than attend meetings together. Right, right, and, and this is where I, I had mentioned earlier that we we watch people become meeting dependent um, to to the point to where if they can't get I mean you've heard it you've heard it you may have even have said it at one point in your life man if I don't get to a meeting I'm going to be in trouble and and, and so well at some point at some point your relationship with yourself and with your creator has got to go deeper than that uh, you know it, there there is uh, 
people have said, well, if Alcoholics Anonymous didn't exist, if NA didn't exist, and some of these others, where would we be? Well, you know, there may come a time, there has in China, where meetings were dissolved because of the government coming in and saying, you can't even say higher power, let alone talk about any kind of spirituality or God. Do these people go back out and drink and use? No, they're staying sober. Because their, their, their recovery is not dependent on the gathering of people they meet with, uh, over coffee and talk about their day at noon every day. It, it, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about a relationship with a power greater than themselves. Uh, it's about broadening their spiritual walk. And why, why do we dance around that, Mark? Why, do, why don't we want to get in that more? We learned so many excellent tools in recovery. We, we learn tools that have to do with opening up and sharing and, and coming to grips with our feelings. Yeah. And these tools are they're beneficial to society. They're beneficial to all our relationships. They're, they're beneficial at work. They're beneficial at the, the, the supermarket, uh, out in traffic on the interstate. I mean, there are so many tools that we learn that help in all aspects of life that if we were to not just confine ourselves and close ourselves off and think that we can only talk about it with somebody else in recovery, we could open the door to a lot more people living happier, healthier lives. And part of my, and, and I, I don't mean to get on a soapbox, but part of my life, my thought life, mm -hmm. to share as much as I can. Yeah, and and it, it's in whatever aspect that you know it, it happens to be in. Look, I, I I tell you a quick story. A couple of years ago, we had a um, company get together, and um, we we went to a sporting event. We had a suite, and there was an open bar and food, and the whole company was there. And you know, I'm standing talking to one of the people that I work with. And she's having a glass of wine, and I'm drinking from a bottle of water. And out of nowhere, she looks me in the eyes and she says, "You don't drink, do you?" <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I know. And, and you know, and I had that brief moment of, "Okay, where do I go with this?" Yeah. And it it was unflinching. And I looked back at her and I said, "No, I don't." And she said, "How did you do that?" Yeah. And I knew. I just knew intuitively, and I said to her, Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. said, my husband's coming home from treatment this week, and I don't know what to do. Wow. What an open and, door. And if I was secretive and afraid and and, and not, you know, out there yeah. in my recovery, yeah. I, I could have never had that opportunity to share with this woman and to talk to her about, you know, what she was about to go through. And the thing that I've learned much better in the last several years, how, to, how to, what, what is within my scope and what isn't, I gave her to my wife. I said, you want to talk to a woman that had to deal with an alcoholic? You need to talk to my wife. Not there you me. go. There you go. I've done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful stuff, the man. opportunities that I think are presented to us if we're mm -hmm. open about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, because we cheat people. We cheat people out of uh, of what we're supposed to be giving away, you know. Um, right. You know, in the old days, we didn't wait people to come to us. We made the approach, you know. Uh, that's that's just that's just a great story. You, you made a statement um, on your website, and I just love this. Uh, this is in regards to the, the uh, being an effective coach. Uh, you said if I was to be an effective coach and I had to accept the path chosen by my client and had to become knowledgeable of these paths, not judgmental, this revelation, and this is the, this is the part I wanted to hone in on uh, as we close this out, uh, this revelation opened me to better emotional sobriety. Uh, that is a, 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 a buzzword or term that um, I just absolutely embrace. Bill W. said emotional sobriety was the next frontier, uh, that the steps and traditions, you know, were, were the beginning, but emotional sobriety. And we know that Bill dealt with depression. We know it wasn't clinical. We know it was because of his dependency on other people's behavior to be okay with himself. 
and uh, that emotional sobriety thing. When you said that, man, man, I just got this big grin on my face. What part does emotional sobriety play in Mark Dunn's life? And can you share with the listeners what emotional sobriety means to you? When I was when I was uh, going through the first step, and I objected to my life being unmanageable. <laughs> I believe, and, and I told my sponsor that uh, I go to work every day. I mm -hmm. pay my bills. Mm -hmm. uh, my life is not unmanageable. And he looked at me. He goes, "What about your emotions?" How you doing with your emotions? And I had to stop and think. And, yeah, my emotions were out of control. Wow. I had no idea if I was going to be angry, if I was going to be resentful, if I was going to be uh, greedy or, or, or lustful. I mean, those emotions, I, I wasn't even aware of them for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so when I was told that, emotional sobriety was going to give me the peace of mind that I would be able to face fear and face anger and, and, and face lust and know what the right decisions were. That's what I was looking for. Wow. I was looking for a sobriety that would give me a balance in my life that I, I could, I wouldn't run and hide. Mm -hmm. Those emotions, because they're they're just normal emotions. Sure. I mean, we all have them. Sure. They're, they're, they're part of life. It, it's just being able to, you know, somebody once said to me, when you're really angry, feel that anger. Feel it with every fiber of your being. Just don't do something negative with it. And that's trust in God. Yeah. That's how I don't do something negative with it. Yeah. Good stuff, Mark. Uh, congratulations on what you're doing and the work you're doing with folks and, uh, you know, not being able to, to, to put yourself out there and uh, your involvement with, uh, with, uh, uh our mutual friends, uh, RT and Kenny P, uh, and in the rooms, uh, folks, you can, uh, you can go on in the rooms, go on in the rooms.com, register, it's for free. And, uh, Sunday, evenings at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, you can join the meeting, uh, the uh, AA meeting, and Mark, you facilitate that, correct? Yes, that's that's my, yeah, that's the one I'm, I've been blessed with. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, what, what a great thing to do, I mean, you know, just, here's here's the deal, you know, so many of us, we sit around, especially if you're early in recovery, I understand being meeting dependent when you're early in recovery, I get that. And you may be just chomping at the bit waiting for that meeting to come along. Um, here's a social networking site, the largest of its kind, o almost 300,000 members. That's, that's huge. Uh, and these people are waiting to be your friend. A and they're there. And, and you can access it 24-7. Uh, and there's a there's a there's a ton of meetings on there. Um, what a, what a what a great way to, to to serve your fellow man. And 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 also, Mark, something that I've just come to learn is in the rooms is a great tool for people that are family members or advocates that aren't even addicts or alcoholics, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Besides all the different types of meetings with every type of addiction, there is there, there's there's Al-Anon on there. Um, there's awesome opportunities. There's all kinds of groups on there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to something called Rockers in Recovery Music Festival, right? Which was uh, outdoors down here in, in South Florida. Uh, they have a group on there, and it's it's you know rock and roll people that you will know of or have heard of with you know big time rock and roll groups, and they put on a concert. Yeah, it's uh, John Hollis and the gang. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's phenomenal and. There's just so many different opportunities. And, and one of the things I want to, if I could piggyback on, uh, Monty, is it, it's one thing to go to meetings and understand the meeting's importance in your life. And, and I am one that knows that I need several meetings a week. Mm -hmm. What's important is to carry it out of the meeting. That's right. And talk to those people. 
Yeah, don't go back to your old neighborhood and talk to the junkies and the <laughs> and the alcoholics that you hung out with. But talk to the people you meet in the rooms. Go have coffee with them. Go have dinner with them. Call them up on the phone. Use those people that you meet and become friends. Yeah. Share and talk about everything you want to talk about. Mark, this has been a great hour. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be on the show, my friend. My pleasure, my honor, Monty. Uh, you're you're a, you're a special man. I, I'm really blessed to have met you and have you in my life. Well, thank you so much, and I look forward to a future relationship with you, folks. Mark Dunn has been our guest. Uh, the rest of your life, uh, reaching out, recovery. We didn't get that, that time really this time, but maybe we'll talk about that next time. Uh, reaching out, reco- uh, reach out, recovery. Uh, but his website is markjdunn.com. You can follow the link here at take12radio.com uh, on your internet dial. Don't forget our, uh, email address, take12radio at comcast.net. If you'd like to be on the show, go to take12radio.com, fill out the form, be on the show. If you'd like to submit your recovery music, you can do that. Uh, we have recovery videos up. We are on YouTube. We're LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Oh, Lord. It just doesn't end. Oh, my gosh. Great. This is a great profession for somebody that's OCD like me. Until our next broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Monty Man along with Mark Dunn, and we're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye-bye now. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Kitty, 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 kitty.